Hopefully soon. Okay, cool. We're live today. I'm joined by Alex McEachran, who is the brand manager of marketing at Loop, and he is also a retention enthusiast. So, Alex, welcome. Been a long time coming. Give us an intro into who you are and what your background is in e-commerce. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, Alex McEachran, uh, currently uh, brand marketing at Loop. I've uh, been doing that for almost two years now. Before that was helping brands build loyalty and reward programs at Smile. I was doing that for about five years. So I think one of my claim to fame is I've helped structure probably thousands of loyalty programs in my day. Um, also on the e-commerce front, I have a retention consulting firm that I work on on the side as well called Spark Retention, helping brands get more out of their existing customers. And way back, I think it was in 2016, I also had my own Shopify brand. It was called Spearhead. Uh, we sold men's grooming products. So think like pomades, shampoo bars, that sort of thing. So uh, spent the last eight years trying to touch as many parts of e-commerce and especially on the retention side as I could. Good stuff. So you've had your hands dirty in multiple areas of the, the industry. That's great. First visitor, hey, Nicole, hope you are well. Um, okay, so let's get straight into some topics then. We're going to start with uh, what your main forte is, retention marketing. And there's obviously been like a real conscious shift, I think, in the industry the last year or two where, you know, acquisition is probably not as lucrative as it used to be. And a lot of people have shifted their attention into looking at the retention um, as a way to grow healthily. So let's say, for example, you have been very acquisition heavy and you do need to start doubling down on the retention side of your business. Where do you start? It it's a really good question. And I've probably talked to about five different brands over the last two weeks being like, Hey, where, where do I start? What do I do? What's kind of the low hanging fruit in retention? And I think the answer that a lot of people don't want to hear is I don't think there is necessarily like a quick win in retention that everyone should get started with. It really depends on the specifics of like where your brand is right now, what you sell. Um, but let's pretend we're a brand that's been really heavily acquisition focused for a really long time. And they're now starting to feel the pain. And anybody who listens to this, I bet you're in in that boat in some sense. Either iOS 14 has completely screwed you over or it's mildly annoying. Regardless, a shift to retention is important. So the pillars are, I call them like loops. So if you're going to think about customer retention, everyone thinks about like post-purchase. That's where customer yeah. retention starts. I would actually argue that customer retention starts way before then. And Adam, we've talked about this on the content side. I call it the pre-engagement loop is not everyone's going to be able to buy from you every single day. Someone makes a purchase. You want them to come back and make a purchase the next day. That would be great, but it's not going to happen. But one thing they can do is they can engage with you and your content ongoing. And people will do that a lot of times before they even make that first purchase. So a pre-engagement loop keeps people engaged, entertained, educated while they decide to make that first purchase. If you get that loop going, someone makes a purchase, you have your post-purchase loop going. So that's like your classic post-purchase emails, SMS, um, even loyalty programs can play into that post-purchase loop. And then you have your advocacy loop as well. So once people have gone from making that first purchase to that second purchase, gets a little bit easier every single time, but it's a different set of tactics and a different set of strategies for getting someone to go from five to 12 purchases and making sure that they become a brand advocate for you who's going to help you with a lot of that marketing play as well. Interesting. So how do you not just de-risk the first purchase? How would you start like to condition the customer to you know, focus on retention pre-purchase? Is it just a case of creating like valuable content, making sure that the UGC is prevalent where does it start pre-purchase? Yeah, pre-purchase, both, really. On the content side, like I said, the two biggest things you can do with content are entertain or educate. And yep. educate, it, I, I tend to skew towards educate from a retention standpoint is because I can get people to understand the value of my product and not just like, hey, I want this thing, I'm going to buy it. But like, okay, how am I going to use it? What are the benefits of this? What jobs is it going to help me solve if I actually end up making a purchase? It helps condition people to make the purchase for the right reasons. And if people are making a purchase because of that versus, hey, Adam, 25% off this weekend, come buy it. Now I'm starting that relationship off on a discount and I'm starting by subtracting value, where if I'm using content, I'm starting that relationship by adding value to it. I love that. Yeah, that's very interesting, actually. Do you, and I've actually seen some data as well to show like heavy discounting front ends. 
um, will attract a lot of like low value buyers over time. Are you have you seen the same sort of things when you've looked into the data? So without doing like a big dive kind of like across yeah. everyone, like anecdotally, when someone runs a sale, you're going to see a spike in purchases that day. But when you start to look at like, let's call it like the week or two weeks or whatever your time, your repurchase interval is your time between purchases, like you're going to see a lull in between, like you're going to see a lull after that sale, you're going to spike, yeah. get everyone in there. Everyone who is like thinking about making a purchase is going to go do it. Maybe you encourage some people who weren't going to make a purchase to do it. But then you have all those people who are going to make a purchase anyway. And you're like, oh, 25% off. They come in and they make that purchase. You've just like, I don't know, clean the pipeline out. You've pushed everyone yeah. through. And those people who do make the purchase on the discount, they're never going to see your products at actual full price value. When someone starts a relationship at 25% off, that's what your product is worth to them. They're not going to buy yeah. it. They're not going to be like, oh, this is worth more to me now after that first purchase. So I call it like, it's the death spiral of discounting. First you do 10% off, then you do 15% off, 20, 25. Maybe you go three months between a sale. Next time you go two months. And then all of a sudden you're just perpetually discounting your products. Yeah, that's very interesting. Like you said, you'll see that lull in sales activity and I feel as though um, a lot of marketers obviously use discounting and price promotions to make themselves look good a lot of the time, but they're not taking like a holistic long-term view and delaying that gratification where, as you said, the sales would have came naturally. And oftentimes, as you, you've pointed out, you're just eroding your margin and conditioning the customer to not buy at full price. So not to say, you know, discounts don't have a place, they definitely do, but they're definitely grossly overused and used i think way too much as a shortcut rather than you know as a strategic like placement in the customer journey yeah you got to think of it like i don't know i look at like myself like cell phone company they always give great discounts to people who are just getting started with them but what about me i've been with the same company for three years and they're not giving me anything so i think discounting does have a place it's just i i don't like it as a strategy to start a relationship use discounting as a way to encourage people to bundle products, to increase your AOV, put complementary products with one another that are going to make people see the value in everything you offer. Like that's where you can use discounting to your advantage instead of, you know, 25% off, come get it. I like that. So uses it almost like a reward mechanism as opposed to um, an acquisition strategy. That's, that's quite interesting. Uh, and we can come on to that. Actually, I suppose this is like a fundamental part of rewards programs as well and loyalty, like accumulating and then rewarding people for obviously buying from you frequently. Absolutely. And like on the, on the loyalty side, like I'm giving a discount because there's an exchange of value rather than an extraction of value. So yeah. when the customer is just grabbing 25% off, it's like they didn't have to do anything for that. You just gave it to them where in something like a loyalty program or in that bundling situation, it's we're asking for an exchange of value. I'm willing to give 10% off or 15% off because you are going to do this thing. And it gets people more invested in the purchase decision than they would have if they just grabbed 25% off. I feel like I had to work to get something. Interesting. Yeah, really good points. Uh, quick question from Nicole. I think quality use needs of product naturally without advertising driven which has to be factored into retention also has to deal with brands and their offerings and extensions also bundle over discounts any day 100 percent, nicole bundle a big fan of the bundling strategy over discounting and it's an effective way to get people to make that purchase without needing to put a discount in there hey this weekend only all of our favorites are in a limited edition bundle being mm -hmm. able to put that scarcity towards the bundle as well can really supercharge it yeah, I do like rewarding loyal customers with um, offers off bundles. I think it makes sense. Uh, this is definitely Juliana. Tell Alex I want Lou Apparel. Uh, bro, yeah, can't see the name, but it's it's definitely her. You've got your Liverpool kit on the way, Juliana. Don't worry. Cool. Uh, let's move on. Then we'll go a little bit deeper. Like, obviously, one of the uh, main ways you can increase retention is to build a community around your brand. I know I've seen you speak a lot about this in the past. What are some of the way, uh, or what are some good brands, sorry, who are building communities around your brands, uh, around their brands? Do you have any examples? And how would you approach it from the beginning if you didn't have any community? 
Yeah, again, this is a really tough question to answer and one that I get all the time. So I'll say some brands that you can check out that I think do a really good job of this are like, I think Bird Dogs does a really good job of this. And it it's, there's so many components of how to build an effective community. And that content's one aspect of it, brand voice, brand tone, there if you want to build an effective community, you can't try to be everything to everyone. You need to yeah. select like a, you need to be everything to a select group of people. So if you want to build an effective community, step one is who are my power users? Again, you can go the data route here to find out who they are. You can also just like pick up the phone, start interacting with your customers to figure out who those are. But as soon as you know who they are, building your content, building your experience to tailor specifically to them. That's one way to get this started. And yeah, like it, it's so tough to just say like, there's one thing to do, but a lot of people are looking for shortcuts or tools or like, okay, how do I scale community? That's the wrong question to be a asking if you feel like you don't have a community yet. I call, yeah. call it hand to hand. I call it hand to hand combat. It's like every great community starts because you took the time to have like two or three close connections and those two or three close connections grow into 10 and it just keeps on kind of snowballing from there. And I remember when I was first starting my brand on Shopify, I had one customer, my first repeat customer. I put a note in the package. I said like, Hey, like, here's my, here's my Facebook. Like let's connect on Facebook. He added me on Facebook. We started talking about like what he was looking to do. He ended up being a model and he was like super into tattoos. And we started talking about some of that stuff and he became one of my best customers. And he's telling his cut, like he's telling his friends about that. And it just kind of grows like that. But like, if I tried to start it off with, Oh, what kind of tool can I put in place to start to build this? It kind of defeats the purpose. Community yeah. is this sense of belonging. And if you're trying to automate belonging, I just don't think you're going to be able to do it that well. Yeah. I love that analogy that, that that's interesting because you're almost talking about community like an extension of customer service and experience would you say that's accurate yes i, I think it's a part of it i would argue that your community is built in two places it's built in it's built in your content and like how you're communicating yourself outwardly again people can't buy from you all the time but they can consume that and then it's on the yeah. post purchase side of things so that Customer service does play a big part in it, but even say if someone doesn't interact with your your customer service team or with you directly, they can still become a part of your community because you've provided an amazing experience. You wrote something personal in the unboxing experience. You put the care into putting the right packaging together for when they unbox that. So community, I think it's built post-purchase. It doesn't need to be a one-to-one -one interaction, but people know when you put the effort and the care into making that an experience people are if you think about like the retail experiences people love it's not the one where it's treated like a vending machine where i go in and i scan and i take it out like the people yeah. the retail experiences that people connect with they've built the store to look a certain way to smell a certain way the interactions that you have we in the e-commerce world were a little bit handicapped there because like i can't yeah. reach through the screen and shake someone's hand but i can set like i can show people that i do care about that we just have to do it in much different ways how about channels that you can build a community on? Is there any like preferred medium? For example, Facebook groups, they see a lot of people like trying to migrate post-purchase the customers into there. What do you think about this? Like where's your preferred medium that you would try and build this community? F Facebook groups is my go-to. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone keeps on saying like Facebook, uh, we love to use it as an advertising channel, but there's a lot of brands aren't super active in like their Facebook pages, but I've seen some killer Facebook groups. A really good example of this is Manscaped has the ballers community, um, <laughs> which is a clever play on words. Um, so they move their best customers into this community where they're not just talking about the Manscaped products. They're talking about like grooming tips and all sorts of things where some of the power users can do that. And building it in a Facebook group, it gives the community the tools to be interacting with one another. And that is the key, not just like having a group where like I, the brand am communicating with the customer and the com customer is communicating back with me. If I'm truly going to do this right, I need my customers communicating with one another as well. 100%. And Manscaped does a, 
does a great job of like, how do you just, if you're going to incubate your community, how do you decide who to put in there is like the question you should be asking. And obviously like the easy answer is like your best customers. But one yeah. thing that Manscaped was doing that is so cool is they would use Instagram quizzes. So they'd ask things about the product. And like, if people got all the questions right, someone would reach out and be like, Hey, you know, your stuff, you should be in the ballers community. So like, yeah. if you just try to put people in there and you don't incubate it, yeah. people yeah. aren't going to be like, you're not going to build that camaraderie in there. You need to select the right people in there and you need to fan the flame. You can't just put people into an empty room. Imagine like we grab 20 people, random people, throw them into the room and say, figure it out. It's going to yeah. be pretty tough right. to get the conversation going. You've gave me some great ideas. You know, the, the quiz thing is very interesting. We've been trying to implement, I think I told you about this last time, the concept of community building into email. Like how can we make it more interactive rather than saying, here's an offer, buy this, here's something related to this product. And we did start to implement quizzes in the email and encourage customers to start to respond and interact. And then we were conditioning them to then obviously look for the winners the next days. And we're even doing like educational series where they have to answer questions within the emails, like click through to the website, then we'll share answers. And then like days later, we're saying, okay, how did you do? Like go back, check emails one to two. So then the customer's gone back, like reading the emails again, like trying to, to find out. And the, the results are incredible. Just trying to implement that little bit of engagement and creativity. Um, we're seeing like up to 50%, honestly, engagement increases over um, the previous months where we were just doing, you know, generic sales campaigns and the revenue is going up at full price. So it's, it's crazy what happens when you get people to care deeply. Like you can't just always be peddling your wares. Like you need to be able to build something like that. And I love quizzes, quizzes and emails, quizzes on the site. Like it's an easy way to get engagement. And yeah. like, I talked about like hand to hand versus scale quizzes like that, that in between you can set up a quiz and like be pushing people to it through email, through even I've seen people be use paid acquisition to go to a quiz, to get that interactivity, to learn more so that I don't have to pay to be very tailored with my acquisition. I can be a little bit more generic and a little bit cheaper to get someone into a quiz, understand yeah. more about them and then really target and tailor after that. Yeah, com completely agree with you. Bluemon is another one, right? You bought from them recently. I think they have a crazy Facebook group, like 45,000 members or something. They do. And they have their YouTube channel going like Blue yeah. and like their founder, Joe is just like, it's immediately really, really good. At as well. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Founder needs to be involved in the group. A hundred percent. Whoever like, if yeah. you can't just build it and let people interact with one another and having people like to interact with people. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't know, everyone listening, your branded social accounts when you say something you might get a little bit of interaction but like when the founder builds a presence on a social platform or in a community they get so much more engagement than you would ever get on a brand so yeah if you're building a community and you're going to build a group it doesn't necessarily need to be the founder but there needs to be a person that's associated yep. with that group that is a representative of the brand i think we're seeing aren't we a shift in landscape where brands are having to be more forward facing. And we were talking about this just before the call. It's not just e-commerce where you can have a really powerful connection with the customers from using the brand owner and speaking to them regularly. It's in a B2B context as well. So I think buying cycles have completely changed where people, it's like a humanized approach from sales. So word of mouth, the consumer has more power than ever and they want to buy from trusted sources. Yeah, it, like I feel in the past it was when someone's ready to buy, be where they're going to buy. And that's why like yeah. you saw like the, the rise of advertising. But today it's be around, be educational, be inspiring so that when they go to buy, they already know who they want. Yeah, I think there's a naivety as well, isn't there, between a lot of marketers will think we can force people to buy somehow and you can definitely incentivize people. But at the end of the day, if someone's going to buy, there's so much choice around. So thinking that by brute force, like harassing them and bombarding them, they're going to buy more and more. It's just not going to happen. They'll go to where they get the most value from. I think the reason we fall into that trap too is once you build like, a, you're going to know this more on the email side than I do, but like once you build a big enough list, it's like, oh, yeah, if I send something, I will get sales. Yes. If you play the numbers game, it will happen if you have a big enough list. And like people fall into that all the time. It's, a, it's all just a numbers game. 
that might be true when you have a massive group to go into. Yeah. I'm not advocating for that. I hate that. But you can get like, if you curate that community and curate the customer and like understand and interact with them regularly, you don't need to have a hundred thousand email lists to generate $300. You can generate $300 from five people. Yeah. Yeah. It already works at scale. I agree with you. It's like throwing a dart and then hoping, you know, the number comes up, but ultimately I think again, it just goes back to showing patience and trying to add value to the customer experience and then realizing that the long-term gains are obviously much more than that short-term basis. But yeah, it's the, it's a transition it's happening. Cool. Um, okay. So this is definitely something you've been heavily involved in that you mentioned in the intro. How do you build a successful loyalty program? And I'm really keen to hear your thoughts on this because we've been involved in um, helping brands launch the loyalty programs recently on the email side. So working with things like Swell Rewards, uh, Loyalty Lion, Smile, which I know obviously used to work there as well. Um, obviously, you know the, the concept behind a lot of them is all the same. You purchase, you accumulate points, and that's like a very basic high level overview. When do loyalty programs just fall flat on the face and what makes them actually work? It's a good question. And I was actually going to go there. It's easier to explain why a loyalty program doesn't work than it is to explain why one does. And it really comes down to you didn't build it for the customer. You built it for yourself. And that might seem obvious, but go check out some of the loyalty programs that you love and go check out the ones that you just skipped over. If I have to spend a thousand dollars at your brand to get a dollar off, I don't care. It's not motivating yeah. enough. I'm not getting any sort of value, especially when I come to your site and to give you my email, I get 15% off or every sale you run is 25% off. So you're telling me every single new person can get 25% off, which I guarantee is going to be more than a dollar, but yeah. I, the loyal customer have to spend a thousand to get one. So make sure that that reward balance <laughs> is in place. That's why they don't work. Another reason they don't work is people structure it the right way, but they aren't able to communicate it out there. You can't, it's like putting a new product on your site. If you just put a new product on your site and do nothing to help people find it, nothing's going to happen. You need to be able to promote it somehow. So what you were talking about there, linking it into email, explainer pages, like having a page where people can come and learn more about this. You need mm -hmm. to be able to do that and not just launch it, but ongoing as well. So using emails to run something like a 2x points weekend. Hey, this weekend yeah. only you're getting two times the points as you normally would. Or your point, like if you want to get people engaged or if you want to encourage people to be buying, you can go the other way and say, hey, your points are worth two times more this weekend. And obviously, like if you're only communicating that on your site, you're doing yourself a disservice because someone has to be there. But if you connect it into email, you connect it into SMS, you're actually able to use your loyalty program as a hub and then use campaigns related to your loyalty program outside the site. I love the fact that you just mentioned, and I never thought of that saying your existing points can be worth twice as much because that was the, the main way we were obviously promoting it to date was going in, obviously saying like, you know, double points this weekend or something like that. But that is a, um, I know it just went completely over my head. I don't know why we haven't utilized that technique. It's also a good segment to make too with your emails is people who have enough points for a reward. So say mm -hmm. you do a new product drop and it's like, Hey, this new item just came out and you have a segment of everyone who has enough points for this. You can say like, Hey, this came out and you actually have $5 worth of value, or you have this, you have enough points for a reward to come use this. That way I don't have to give like a generic discount out to everyone. I can be like, yo, Adam, you're holding enough value to use it on this brand new product you're looking at. Can't yeah. Do that. Yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. I, I heard you mention, I can't remember what the, the terminology was for it, but I think it was, it was on your course, which is linked in the LinkedIn, you know, you have a small loyalty course, which explains some of the fundamentals. You mentioned something about making it difficult for a customer to switch to another brand. And I'm not talking about this in the context of like forcing them, but I mean, giving them like a really strong motivation to continuously buy that it's almost difficult to go elsewhere. Can you expand on first of all, what the term is that it's, it's going over my head and how yeah. that works? Yeah. A switching barrier. Um, so yeah. 
I say switch it. I say switching barriers. Some people say switching cost. I don't like it to seem like it's a negative. So we'll say a barrier is a little bit less negative than it's a cost to switch because some people might interpret that like your cell phone company does or your gym membership does where it's like, you got to pay a hundred dollars to break this. That's my switching costs. So like stay with yeah. me. That's like coercing someone to stay with you. We don't want that. But with yeah. a switching barrier, if someone's holding on to a point balance, if they want to go, let's say in that blue man example, if I have a points balance there, it's going to be more difficult for me to be like, I want to shop the, the hairstyle product competition. I want to go see what else is out there. For me to go do that now, if I'm holding a point balance, I have to now consciously say, I'm holding $5 off my next purchase from my previous purchase. If I want to go shop with a competitor, I now have to forego that $5. Or in a better situation is if you use something like tiers in a loyalty program, and hey, someone has made it to that first tier and they get free shipping and they get like additional bonus rewards there. I'm making that switching barrier even higher. If I'm in that tier, it is going to be super, super hard for me to drop like one, two, three, four, five benefits to go and shop with someone else. Very interesting. I've just had an idea pop into my head. It might be completely stupid, but I'd be curious <laughs> to try it. I wonder if you can say to someone, no discount off the first purchase, but 20% off all future purchases and how that would impact things in terms of loyalty. I I don't think it's a stupid idea. Like I'm always finding ways to do that. Like one thing, here's my stupid idea back to you as the as the email person is I so I feel like everyone in e-commerce knows if you go put something in your cart and you abandon, you're gonna get something. And yeah. as I'm as I'm shopping, I, I do this all the time because I want to see what people are doing. And yeah. I'm waiting for a brand to send me a message that says something like, hey, like the first email is basically not offering a discount, but like, hey, you must have got distracted. And I've had a lot of I had a lot of emails that have done that. But then the follow up to that is always the discount. I would love yeah. to see a brand send me an email after that first one that goes like, hey, if you're waiting out for a discount, you're not going to get it. And here's why. We stand by yeah. our products. We believe this. Here's all the education. Here's the reviews. And like build yourself up rather than building your price down. Mate, I love I'm it. I'm waiting to see it. Idea. Yeah, it's a great idea, especially if you have a strong customer support aspect. You can basically just go in and go, yeah, like you said, look, you know, we don't do discounts or we only do them for like valuable customers. Um, so if you want support and if you want us to help you achieve your goals, we're here for you. But if you want, cheap discounts we're not the brands for you and it, it's oh, like somewhere else. <laughs> yeah 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 i like that idea too nicole i've got some ideas i'm gonna have to pay alex for some consultancy after this <laughs> um good stuff mate really interesting love it let's come on to the final topic and which is obviously ties into your current position now so tell us about what you're doing with loop like how returns have typically been looked at as a negative, I suppose, for e-commerce and how you're like flipping the script on that. Yeah. Returns have always been an operations, logistics, cost center play for pretty much every single brand. And if you flip the script and look at it as a potential as, or as a retention play, or even as a profit center, you start to look at returns much differently. And one thing I love to say is a return does not equal a refund. We in the industry have made those two things synonymous. Return equals bad because I'm giving people their money back. Now, 52% of returns that happen on Shopify are because someone has the wrong size. So if we assume that every single return, someone wants their money back, 52% of the time, they just have the wrong product, a product they don't love, the wrong size. If you make an exchange easy, you're able to keep that customer around. You do not want people holding products that they don't love. And I see a lot of brands do that is they'll bury their return policy. They'll make it very difficult. Hey, call this support number, email this. It's like a four day process to make it happen. The brands that are turning this into a retention play, they know if they make getting the product that that person loves. And I don't want to say rectifying a mistake, but like you feel very vulnerable when you order a pair of shoes and you're a size off. That vulnerability can turn into frustration really quickly, or it can turn into love for that brand. If they're yeah. able to set, if they're able to fix it. Yeah. So it's an opportunity. You're, you're flipping the script and you're seeing it as an opportunity. It's almost to you know, go in and have that positive interaction with them. Like who was a four returns can be a positive thing for the business. It it's crazy. Like 
people, so we obviously at Loop, we're all about the exchange and we want to be moving refunds to exchanges. And there's a couple of yeah. like, there's ways you can do that. But even on a refund, if you're giving the money back, like we recently just did a study to try to figure out are people who are returning going to repeat purchase at a higher rate than those that don't. And even people who are refunding, they want their money back. And like, even I used to think of that as like, that's usually a mark of the relationship yeah. probably over, but they're 17% more likely to come back after making a refund than someone who doesn't have a refund event. And if you go to an exchange, they're, th they're almost 34% more likely to come back if they're able to exchange something into what they love. So like where, what I read between the lines there is you never want someone holding onto a product they don't love. Like Adam, yeah. I'm sure you've bought something and you're like, eh, I'm too lazy to return this. Yeah. yeah. And it just sits in your closet. Like from the brand's perspective, they're looking at that and like, Oh, Adam got what he like, got what he wanted. Like now let me go try to like do all my post purchase flows and get him to come back. But in your head, you're like, I don't like this. And they'll have yeah. no idea. They'll have no idea. But if they made it easy for you to get into one that you did love, you're more likely to come back and make another purchase. You're more likely to tell your friends about it. It's good all around. I, I agree. Do you think that it makes the points as well? It's crucial not to just assume that someone's happy, even if they've received the product and they don't say anything. Like what level of aftercare is needed to someone beyond like, you know, here's a review request. Do you think like a customer support check-in, like a sincere, you know, plain text email or someone like, you know, Alex Luke, Hey, you know, did you get your product? We would love to know if there's anything we could do. I think brands have been averse to that in the past because they might open up that dialogue and, and it's sort of changing the landscape. Yeah, I, I love that idea. And one thing I say too is after the purchase, like send people and actually encourage them to make an exchange if they want to. It's like, hey, Adam, like just checking in, like everything good to go. Just remember, and again, if you have a customer centric policy, Hey, you have 90 days to exchange this for something. Like if you don't love it, let's get you into something you do love. Or if you don't have something like that, even the support check-in, like, Hey, how's it going? Anything we can do here? Like that is one of the best ways we we're talking about hand-to-hand -hand combat at the beginning of this. Like there's a fantastic way to start that one-to-one -one interaction. That's going to start to build that community up. And you're right. I think brands, actually everyone in general is a little bit scared to open that up because you don't want to hear the negatives. But like, I think like, Someone, John at Baseballism, he always says this. He's like, you don't want to hear it, but when you hear those things, those are like the level up step change things. <laughs> yeah, like you, you need those feedback it, loops. You yeah, yeah, yeah you need those feedback loops. I think it's it's complacency, isn't it? We, and I know even in the agency world, it's not uh, just applicable to e-commerce. Sometimes you think your job is done when you've concluded the sale, but actually it's really just the beginning of the relationship. And then your goal is, to water that flower and make sure water that seed, sorry, and make sure it like turns into a flower. Um, and yet crucial is to, to follow up with aftercare. And that book you recommended to me, was it the uh, Joey Coleman, How to Never Lose a Customer? I know he talks a lot about, obviously like people think they've done the job after the initial stage, but actually like it's just beginning and that sort of hundred day period is just crucial. Yeah, everyone, everyone in e-commerce should pick that book up. It is, a no one will read that book and walk away without being like, I'm going to do this to my, for my business right now. Like it just can't happen. Yeah. It's no good. <laughs> yeah. I actually wrote extensive notes down. Um, I picked it up on your recommendation and I went through, he obviously has modules, doesn't he? Where within each section, you're meant to write notes down. And um, actually I was quite surprised. I think I did a great job on a lot of areas, but there was so many areas I went, wow. Like we need to, you know, double down on this. Like there's a problem in the business in this area. And yet it, it, it really put it in the context of like the buyer's journey rather than as brands and, you know, business owners, we're always like what works best for us. But I think if you focus on what works for the customer, then you're more successful as just as a byproduct of caring for them. I, I think the biggest thing from Joey's book is like, how do I get them to see success with my product as quickly as possible? And I think that's where a lot of brands miss. And like the one that blew my mind when we had Joey on, um, the, the book we're talking about is Never Lose a Customer Again by Joey Coleman. And the one recommendation he had when, when I had him on our podcast was, hey, if you're selling candles in every single package that you send out, put a box of matches in it so that someone can light it right away. 
Because when I get yeah. that candle, it hasn't served its function yet. I probably bought that candle to make my room smell great. So why not give people the tools to get to that point where they feel like it's done the job that they wanted? Or like, I know you work with some supplement brands. It's like the exact same thing. I got the, I have the protein powder in front of me. It hasn't done what I wanted it to do yet. I don't feel any sort of affinity or loyalty or I don't know anything towards that brand until they're able to help me get to what I actually bought that product for. Yeah. And that's actually something in my first ever company when I was 17 in e-commerce. So this is like obviously 14 years ago. We used to add a shaker bottle to anyone who spends over a hundred pounds. So about like $120. Um, and obviously like that was, you know, to mix the protein powder, but sometimes like the customer was all to one and anyone who takes protein supplements will know like they, you go through these shaker bottles like so quickly because you never wash them out and then they stink and they can't lose the smell. Um, but like the amount of feedback we used to get off customers where they would share pictures just of the shaker bottle rather than like these hundreds of pounds worth of supplements that they've just purchased. And it's such a simple touch. Even note, like you said something there without even realizing it, I think it's like, Hey, these start to stink and like all this, like there's some other things that you can play off. Of yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Like, how do I get someone to value, but like show that you understand the struggle as well. Like have something in there, like, Hey, I know, like, I know you're not going to wash this frequently. Like you're not, you might not have a, a lot, like, I don't know. You, why am I blanking? Not a washing, a dishwasher, geez, a dishwasher to put this in, or it might not be dishwasher safe. Like, Hey, toss this and shake it around. Like that will help you out. Like just give people tips, give people tricks to understand, like, how do I get more and more out of this? Yeah. Yeah. I, I love it. I think, you know, you could, you can go really deep, couldn't you, about all the brands that we've worked with. And there's so many really cool things if you just put the, the time to think about it. And that leads to that word of mouth marketing, doesn't it? Which is obviously like the most powerful source of referrals. And people just don't, it's, it's like they don't think about the small touches like that anymore. Or that maybe they're starting to come back to them, like the value of giving without expecting anything in return. Yeah. And that giving without expecting anything in return like that, I think that's the biggest piece that we're all missing on the retention front right now is someone yeah. makes a purchase. It's like, okay, now what do I need? What do I need from them? I need UGC. I need a review. I need a referral. I need all these things like, okay, but what do they need? And if you give them what they need, yeah. they're, they're going to come back. Like it's going to come back full circle to help you out. Yeah, man. Love it. Just love it. Great stuff. Um, Again, I, I think brands that, you know, really mature and are able to invest in this are going to win big because, um, as you've said, if you're just looking at it purely, I mean, it is a business decision, obviously, you know, we know that there's going to be a positive net gain from doing things like this, but it's with the customer first rather than the brands. And yeah, huge rewards for people willing to put efforts into this. It's funny too, because we're all shoppers, right? Every yeah. single person who owns a brand, you buy from other brands too it's putting that customer hat on rather than the brand hat. And I've had, I've had a couple like podcast episodes where I interview my mom and we just start talking about like her experiences with like buying things online. And like it, yep. it can blow your mind how people are thinking about your marketing tactics, your post-purchase experience. Like if you just put your consumer hat on and take your brand hat off and easier said than done, like you really have to try to take yourself out of that mindset. And like I, I do yeah. it as a marketer, even in the SaaS world, like sometimes I'll like go and I'll be shopping for something or looking for a tool. I'll go and I'll check a site and I'll be like, man, that sucks. I'm like, wait, we do that too. <laughs> yeah. I think um, Joey speaks in the book actually, doesn't he, about allocating like a percentage of your profits to invest in that type of experience to create that like obviously like positive feedback loop. And I think that's a really interesting idea just to touch on it from a B2B standpoint as well. Um, last year we did a email automation setup for a brand and at the end of the project they sent us a um, it was around Christmas time like a huge box with like loads of traditional British craft beers and snacks and like all these new upcoming brands and it I'm st you, you can see right I'm still talking about it today like seven <laughs> months later and I'm still telling everyone like how we, we don't work with them anymore, but that left such an impression on me. And I always tell people about this brand because they gave something without expecting anything in return. And even with like that swag game is uh, so many people will be like, Hey, here's a, 
like let's use loop as an example like here's a loop water bottle here's a loop this here's a loop that like i'm still trying to do something for myself i'm trying to get like my brand out there but like the craft beers like that's just that's something just for you and one thing i like i've been pushing really hard for our team at loop is like we are so involved in the shopify community like how do we support that if we're going to be giving gifts how do we give gifts that are helping support the shopify brands like i don't want to go to some printer and print i don't know all this i don't know you go to a you go to a conference i just call it like the junk like most of it ends up in the in the trash yeah. bin on the way out, out of the conference room right like i don't want that i want people to be getting things that like they recognize in the shopify community and like just build around that give value without it being like oh here's a loop this here's a loop that yeah yeah focusing on the customer experience and not the brands i think ultimately is the take-home message a hundred percent cool well mate it's been a pleasure um honestly incredible insights loads of things actually i'm gonna go and think about and implement with some of our clients so thank you for the free consulting how can people contact you if they want to find out more and ask you some more questions yeah um pretty active on linkedin um you can get me there if you search my full name alex mckechran um i might be the only one on linkedin but you'll definitely find me um you can check out our podcast it's called the exchange uh we're talking about post-purchase customer experience all the time um you can also check out the loop uh website and blog if you want any tips tricks strategies on turning returns from a cost center into a profit center and uh I feel like I'm just listing off so many things. Finally, the last place you can you can find me is at sparkretention.com if you want to talk anything retention. Awesome. Well, you clearly know your stuff, Alex. It's been a pleasure. Um, yeah, I'm going to tag you on this. If anyone has any follow-up questions, please feel free to drop them in LinkedIn, and I'm sure Alex will get back to you. But thank you so much for your time. Great insights. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. It was a ton of fun.